Welcome to the Rock Music Alliance interview sessions. I'm your host, Cole Coleman, along with keyboardist Claudio Pesavento, who's from Mahogany Rush and the Chris Squire Band. On our show today, you know his vocals from his time with Yngwie Malmsteen, Talisman, Trans-Siberian Orchestra, Sons of Apollo, and much, much more, including countless guest appearances, and his being the voice of Steel Dragon singer Bobby Beers in one of my favorite movies, Rockstar. Welcome to our show, one of the greatest voices in rock, RMA Award winner, Jeff Scott Soto. Hey, Gentlemen, man. such a pleasure to see you here. I mean, I normally see you somewhere out and about when we're uh, watching bands and such, but uh, now it's quieter and we can actually speak. <laughs> yeah, it, it's great you came on our show. Really appreciate it. And uh, I want to just jump right in because there's a lot to cover, actually. Uh, Jeff, Absolutely. what is the latest upcoming release that uh, that you're on? Who's it with? Tell us all about it. Well, it's a band called Art of Anarchy. Uh, the band was pretty much kind of left for dead in terms of they uh, they had issues with the first two singers. The first two records had two different singers, both aptly named Scott. I'm the third Scott, I, I, as I like to put it, the third Scott's a charm. Um, but they, uh, they pretty much just went on a, kind of a permanent hiatus around 2017 or so, right when Sons of Apollo was about to take off. But I remember listening to the material. Just I really liked the songs. I love the music that uh, these guys put out. I wasn't too crazy about the singers because I wasn't really fans of Creed or or Stone Temple Pilots back in the day. But I loved what these guys were putting out as far as content. And I told Ron, man, it, what what a pity. I would have loved to have sound hear, heard what I sounded like with the band. And uh, had they called on me back in the day, it, I would have jumped on this because I love their music. So we fast forward into the uh, the lockdown when they were pretty much dormant as far as what are we doing with is is there really a future should we even continue but they were still writing songs just for the sake of especially everybody was looking for their own therapeutic way of getting through the lockdown and they continued writing songs they got together even during the the lockdown because they were both they were all three very safe as the Boda brothers john and vince Boda, who are twins the bass i'm sorry the drummer and the second guitar player and bumblefoot Bumblefoot is longtime friends with these guys. They started a, a, a basically around 2011 or so, just writing songs. And the the uh, the, the brothers basically they just got tired of uh, the politics of the business and trying to put a band together, keep a band together, get the singers and all that. That they decided, let's just make an album, our dream album, a dream recording. We're gonna finance it just for us. We're gonna put it together just for us. And they eventually got Scott Weiland to commit to it. From that, they got a deal and they actually just kept Wyland as the the only singer. They turned it into a band. And uh, unfortunately, the, the circumstances led to them uh, dismissing Wyland and Scott Stapp for the second album. And it, during the lockdown, I just I reached out again to Ron and I, we're just catching up. And I just said, man, this this group is it, what a pity. And he said, you know what? We're still working on songs. Let me call the brothers and let's see if they'd be interested in hearing what you would sound like on these new songs. Before he could even finish the sentence, they said, yes, he's in. There was no auditioning. There was no, let's check out the chemistry because obviously my my history and my career kind of speaks for itself in terms of what they were looking for, what they would have, they loved to have as their front man and vice versa. I really love the music. I, I wasn't, they weren't looking for me and I was more or less offering my services. And from that, we recorded two albums worth of material. And it was finally time to condense what we felt what were the best songs for an actual album. And that's coming out in February. The first single was just released last month. Uh, it's a song called Vilified. And the the first four singles and videos, they all tie into each other. We're, it's not really a concept album, but in, in a way it is the way we're tying the themes and each video will end where the next one begins and it's 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 kind of cool how we're tying it all together but man they they're really going for it because they realize that they have a singer who can commit and who's willing to actually be part of this situation as opposed to just you know grabbing the dough and saying all right i, I got my other stuff to do good luck guys and uh yeah it's the art of anarchy well, well, that's that's terrific to hear because I mean, you know, I mean, you do so much session work and recording yeah. for other people that that you know you might think that well, you know, it's another session for me, but but it's great to hear that this this could be much more of a committed project, you know, and, sure. and I can and I can totally at this point in your career, I mean, you're extremely well known, so it's kind of like, uh, oh yeah, Soto wants to sing on it, yeah, he's in, you know, mm -hmm. no audition, you know, <laughs> you know, I, I I used to have to answer to that back in the day when people would 
criticize me for, you know, for not staying in one lane, not sticking to one thing that maybe my career would have advanced a little further had I just focused on one item. But to be honest with you, there, there weren't too many things that offered the variety of what I wanted to do as an artist, to, to, to offer the the chance to kind of spread my wings and do all the things that make me me as as an artist, as a singer, as a producer, as a writer, all of the all of the above. And I really needed to kind of I needed to fulfill my creativity. And that's why I was bouncing around from different bands and doing different projects at the time. Now it's commonplace everywhere you look. There's, everybody's in multiple bands, especially the older artists, you know, artists around my age. They're like, you know what? I can't just do one thing. I have too much more in me to actually put out there. And that's why somebody like Mike Portnoy, he's in so many different bands because he wants to do so many different things, but not there's not one band that can just do all these different things. And for me, it was always the the influence I got from Queen. When you think of a band like Queen, they were the the masters of all their destinies. You know, they they did pop, jazz, rock, blues, soul, opera, you name it. They yeah. they tackled them all and they did them all and they did them all well. Yeah, they're a very, very works. eclectic band, yeah. and you know, not, 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 uh, not putting themselves in a box. You know, they're they're, they're breaking out Absolutely. of boxes. And, too, and there aren't too many bands or artists that can get away with it. I wanted to try and be one of those. I wanted to, I wanted to push myself and challenge myself creatively as a, as a musician, as even a fan of the music I listen to, instead of just staying in one lane and putting the blinders on. I, I could have easily just stayed with Ingbe or or stayed with just one thing and just said, this is just one lane I'm going to stay in. But I decided I want to tap into all these different lanes and, and express myself as an artist. And uh, of course, if one of them sticks, I would have to commit to it a little more than say some of the other ones I was bouncing around with. But it's unfortunately, it's unfortunate that in the past, that was more the reason why I was bouncing around because Talisman to me was probably the closest to doing pretty much everything I wanted to do musically. We did, you know, we did a lot of groove oriented stuff. I was able to throw a lot of soulful and, and uh, my R&B touches on a lot of stuff. And that band really was well-rounded as far as I was concerned compared to some of the other things that they just wanted to stay in one lane, whether it's AOR, melodic rock, the hard rock or heavy metal, Talisman did it all. And that's, uh, that's a testament to why that band was around as long as it was. Well, from what I've heard, from just one release from this band and of course you know uh knowing who's who's all in the band uh this this certainly has like all the potential and all the ammunition of being a multifaceted you know long running you know project that's is is and i wanted to ask you as as a uh, solo artist a person who writes you know naturally you've got to feel like you're expressing yourself so are you involved in the writing absolutely and that's that was one of the things that really uh that really got me interested in doing it there's there are a lot of things where i'm just a session guy or they'll send me everything's pre-written and you just basically put your voice to it just follow the guides and put your voice to it and of course you're gonna you're gonna get me more loyal if you're giving me the chance to express what i have to say what i have to uh to, to put out there but the best part is uh i don't just close that door and say well i'm the I'm singing it, so I have to write it. Of course, I I ask if the guys have a particular theme they want to go for. If they want it, uh, it, it when I when I write this stuff and I even demo it for the first time, I'm, it's not like a it's in cement. It's not like a closed door. It's like listen to what I got. If you think there's room for improvement on certain things, or if you want, if you hear something else that uh, that I'm doing besides what I sent, and we craft it and put it together because I'm not the sit down in a room with uh, two or three people and, and and start churning out a song and writing it in sections and all that. I love hearing the, the, the full canvas, but without vocals. And then that's where, hmm, this happens, this happens, this happens. And for the most part, 90% of it stuck. You know, there, w- there weren't any real rewrites or can we go back and add this or re- or d- delete that? It's, it's, uh, it's a great uh, give and take that I got with the guys. And I even had that with Sons of Apollo. It's, it's, uh, it really helps my focus and my commitment to the band and to the, my loyalty to them that, uh, they're giving me the chance to express myself. Yeah. Let, let Jeff out of the box, man. Let the man go. (laughs) Well, you know, and and we go, we harken back to how this started, you know, you, you named, you rattled off all these bands and, uh, next year's my 40 year anniversary doing this professionally. If wow. by now, wow. I, I, it doesn't matter if I never had a top 10 hit or uh, a 10 million selling record, I still know how to write and craft a good song. Now, it is all subjective to opinion as well. 
but my opinion is I've I've got the experience to know exactly what to put into a song. Then it's a roll of the dice to see if somebody can make it, you know, make it happen. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Hey, hey Claudio, um, have you had a chance at all to check out Art of Anarchy? Not yet. Uh, yeah. Well, now. Yeah, yeah. Check it yeah. out. Check it out. Videos um, on, we were we were uh, lucky to have Cuba Gooding Jr. as the uh, he 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 was the main actor in the video portraying what the actual lyrics are about, which deals a lot with PTSD and mental health. And uh, and the narration, there's a narration of like a newscaster narrating certain pieces and uh, uh, that was done by Jeff Tate. It's, so it's kind of got that uh, Operation Mind Crime kind of vibe to it because Tate just has that kind of voice and delivery that is it really just, it's it's chilling, it's haunting. Oh yeah, yeah, I gotta, I gotta say, you know, for the listeners right now, uh, who maybe haven't checked it out uh, uh, yet? Yeah, definitely check it out. Uh, I, I love this first release. I mean, just just the one song is all I've heard, and I absolutely yeah. love it. Musically, it's dark and heavy. It's got uh, some great guitar work, of course. You know, from Ron Bumblefoot, and uh, the video is really it's just as dark psych uh, 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 psychologically. You know, and uh, yeah. I, I wanted to find out. You know, uh, what is it exactly that you really are as as the writer? Uh, what are you wanting to communicate with that video? Because it it was heavy. It's giving me some chills here and there, you know? Well, during the lockdown, uh, maybe even before, uh, the, our second guitar player and founder of the band, John Voda, was dealing with a, a health issue. Um, his health was declining. It wasn't, wasn't COVID. It wasn't COVID related. But he was going through, he basically was dying. He was on his deathbed and he was bedridden for so long. And during that time, he basically just lie in bed with his guitar as somebody who's really committed to their craft and their instrument does. And he would on uh, days on end be watching the movie, the Joker, and he would be kind of playing the guitar and kind of coming up with um, kind of his own version of a soundtrack and an underlying soundtrack or, or score music that while he was watching it, things that when he was watching a certain scene, certain things would come out from what he was just messing around with on the guitar and vilified was one of those songs. And that was actually one of the first ones that we that the guys did together uh, that we did together. So from that, because the Joker was the main influence of how that song came about, we kind of focus on this, not the storyline of the Joker, but just the premise of somebody who's misunderstood, somebody who's not given a chance or, or treatment or help to not be deemed as crazy or not be deemed as uh, uh, somebody that's insane or that somebody that's that's uh capable of hurting other people and that's pretty much the premise of the joker they they didn't want to just villainize him or vilify him they wanted to show the other side of why he became what he became and so we kind of went with that premise and that's what the the actor uh cuba gooding jr is portraying in the video he's portraying somebody who was put in a situation that from it came up with a ptsd trauma and and everybody just deems them as dangerous as opposed to saying, hang on a second, if we just take the time to actually see what's really going on, then we 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 can actually help this person. And instead of just saying, well, this person's crazy, let's just throw them in jail. Wow, man. And uh, tell me, um, how in the world is the connection with Cuba Gooding Jr.? Like, how did that well, come about? The thing is, uh, Bumblefoot and I have been around for... As long as we have, you know, we've met a lot of people, the voters, they know their people, they, 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 with the business that they do, they meet a lot of famous and a lot of, uh, a, a lot of known people. And even our video director, uh, Dale, he's, he's very well connected with a lot of people in the industry. So when we we're, they were throwing out names and like, there were two names. I, I don't want to talk about the other one because I don't know if the guys want, or maybe this other actor wants to be known as the one that was supposed to do it as well. But uh, Q was the one that said yes, and we thought his portrayal would be exactly what we needed for the video. Well, it was it was really something. Like I say, it's um, you know, you get some. It's a little disturbing here and there. That's for sure. You know, I, I urge people to go check it out. You know, now, um, you know, uh, uh, art. There's of Anarchy, a bit of a happy ending, but it's 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 kind of an open ended uh, resolve in this video because you'll see how it takes off, how it kind of continues on the next one when we finally get that out. Do, do Cuba told you to show me the money now? <laughs> <laughs> I knew one of you were going to say it. <laughs> Leave it to Claudio, man. He's uh, he, he gets the zingers in, you know. <laughs> I don't talk much, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
yeah, this is this is a super group of musicians. You know, tell us once again, kind of slowly, like like who all is in Art of Anarchy? What are they What are they doing? What are they playing? This current lineup is Ron Bumblefoot Thal, as, we, as most people know from Guns N' Roses and Sons of Apollo. We we've, we've been working together closely together since 2017, and uh, now we're going to continue working together. And the original bass player John Moyer, who is also in Disturbed is not joining us for the continuation of the band because he wants to focus his his energies to disturb. They're going to be very busy and he knows he won't be able to give us uh, the full commitment of time and everything for us to be able to, to get this thing on the road and even just do the promotion and all because disturb this, they're, they're still kicking ass out there. So I brought in my bass player from Soto, who's also the bass player from the East version of trans Siberian orchestra, Tony Dickinson. Strangely enough, he replaced David Z in TSO and he replaced yeah in my band Soto so when we were looking for a bass player I I knew Tony was he is one of the most well-rounded musicians that I know on the planet he's not just a great bass player he's a great producer writer he plays keys uh guitar he, he just does everything he's just amazing so and he, he's a good looking young guy that I thought might kind of give us the the Voda brothers they're they're in there for they're like I think they're both 40 and me and Ron are the elder statesmen. So it's Tony Dickinson on bass, John and Vince Voda, the, the original founders, they're twins in the band. They play drums and second guitar. And that's that's the band. That's the five of us. That's great. And, and your connection with the band, you said, came through Ron, right? Yeah. yeah. Because Ron, they were dealing with the second album and, and whatever was going on with uh, their situation during that time in 2017 when we were just launching Sons of Apollo. And that's how I learned about the band. And I was like, damn, this is really good stuff. I, I wonder what I would have sounded like singing on this. Right, right. Now, now, well, how did your connection with Ron happen in your life? That was from a past band? No, absolutely. Sons of Apollo. I, that I Even when we were already in the band together, when, uh, when Derek and Mike uh, told me that Ron would be in the band and that that would be the lineup, I didn't meet Ron until months after that. We hadn't even spoken. We hadn't. Uh, there were no email connections or anything. I did the Monsters of Rock cruise in 2017, early, yeah, sometime early 2017, and he was on it. That's where we actually first met. So it, it's our first connection, our first meeting was in 2017. And it's that's just great, been, man. And, and you, those, guys, you guys hit it off, huh? Oh, man. He's, he's beyond. I, I played with some of the best guitar players in the world from Neil Sean to Ingve Malmsteen. I mean, it's just, the, the list is on and on. And, and Ron is just one of those complete players. He, he, he can do virtually anything. And I love his musicality. I love his personality, his, his characteristics, his charisma. He's got the full package. So I knew that's somebody I wanted to latch on. Even if Sons of Apollo wasn't doing anything or we were dormant, I wanted to continue doing stuff with Ron. And that's what, exactly what we're doing. Yeah, that's that's great. That's great. Yeah, I guess um, so, yeah he really is. You know, he, he needs a thimble slide, though. He needs to check that out. You know? <laughs> he does. I brought, I, I, brought up, I brought it up recently because as anybody who knows Ron's playing, he's got a little a little hole on his guitar that he's able to put his pinky into and pulls out a little thimble when he wants to get really high on the uh, on the strings there. Sometimes he, he gets past the frets, you know, just to get certain notes for effect or whatever. But uh it's time to incorporate the thimble slide. Yes. Yeah. yeah he's got to at least check it out, Ron. If you're listening, you're listening. You got to at least check out the thimble slide. I, I, think, I think, I think, I think you'll find it's a, it's a useful tool. You know, maybe I, I think, gotta, I gotta sit down with you. Maybe, you know, grab a guitar and I'll, I'll give you an in-person demo, you know? And, but, and I, and the greatest thing is I think Ron would use it for the first time and he'll master it. That's, that's how crazy yeah, he'll, yeah. he'll put it on and go, I know exactly what to do with this. <laughs> oh, exactly. Exactly. Well, I'll tell you that that has happened. Um, you know, uh, the first time I ever saw that happen, I was doing the Guitar Summit show in Mannheim, Germany, you know, selling selling my my stuff there. And a kid came over and he goes, hey, man, Thomas Blug is playing. You got to you got to get him get him your uh, slide. So Thomas, he's actually on stage and I go running down there. and I, I, I took a guess on what size he might might uh, wear. And um, and the guy he said, here, let me let me give it to him. So so I gave it to the kid and uh, he's a you know teenage kid, you know. And he goes running up to the stage, hands it to Thomas, and he just like immediately he slammed it on his finger, and within a second, like he slammed it on his finger, and boom, began to just just use it like he'd been yeah. using it forever. It was amazing, you know. Yeah, I, I love that you walk around with your, your kind of like, like a little kit. You remind me of somebody who who's sizing uh, wedding rings for people. You've got the 
it, the thing to, to to make them smaller, make them bigger, and then you just perfectly customize it right on the spot for somebody. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah, at, at some events, some events where I, I know I'm, I'm probably going to run in, run into people, I'll try to bring that along. You know, yeah. I did, like that a, to, I did that to Doug Average, and he was like, he was like, they look at it, and then I tried to figure it out what what do I do with this, and then like. And yeah, some, like, some 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 people like get it, it some people like don't. <laughs> Yeah, Doug's okay. great. Doug's one of my favorite players out there. He's great. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I, Doug was there, by the way. I ran into Doug in an elevator out there in in uh, Mannheim. We said I said hello. I, I reminded him who I was, and you know, showed him right. the thermal slide again. You know, so that that's always fun when you're bumping into people here and there. You yeah. know. So uh, as a solo artist, I wanted to touch just a little bit on your own releases. Um, sure. You know, uh, tell us a little bit about your your most recent release. As I recall, it's complicated, is what's called. Yeah. And uh, I got to tell you, you know, um, this is a powerhouse release. You know, it, it's uh, I'd say it's high energy, melodic, hard rock. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's uplifting and anthem, you know, uh, anthem like uh, you got to be an athlete to play this kind of music, you know, to, pl to oh, yeah. play that full album. You, know, you got to be in great shape. You got to be like lifting weights, you know, doing a little jogging and uh, even listening to the album. I was catching my breath, you know, <laughs> start <That's> awesome, <laughs> you know, but uh, do you feel like things really came together quickly for that album or was it difficult to put it together? It was very easy, especially because uh, the bulk of the work was done with and by my uh, my producer and writer of the album, Alessandro Del Vecchio. It was the second one we'd done together. The The first one we did together was called Wide Awake in My Dreamland. That came out during the pandemic. It came out in 2020. And we had such a great time making that record. I told him, let's do the next one together. Um, for, for Wide Awake, he pretty much tapped into a lot of different facets of my career and the songs that he personally liked and the the style and the genres he personally liked that I'd done up to that point. But Complicated was more geared towards the talisman side of what I've done because it, musically, we connect more on talisman from, from anything else I've done in my career. Um, and so he really he guided me let's let's almost make a, a talisman tribute album in terms of the vibe the energy the sound the uh the genre and that's exactly what we set out to do and it's funny because i always people were always asking me uh when i was doing the interviews for that album where did i come up with the title when what's what's behind the title complicated and uh, 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 it's going to go back to everything we've already said or that i've already said I want to do so many different things in my life, musically, genre-wise. I want all the colors of the rainbow musically. And if uh, an artist, I'm sorry, a journalist one time asked me if I if I went to somebody and said, you have to check out Jeff Scott Soto. And they asked, what does he do? What what kind of style does he do? What would be your answer? What would you, what would I tell them? How would I answer that question? And I said, well, it's complicated. <laughs> it's It's not, I don't, stay in one lane. I don't do one direction. I, I I do so many different things. So it would be difficult. You pretty, pretty much have to ask them what they're into. And then you can kind of guide them into certain albums or bands that I've done, because if you guide them to this one, they're going to hate me. You guide them to that one. They're going to go, what the hell is this? But there's so many different things that I can and have done that it's complicated to, to kind of peg me into a genre laden artist. And that was the, the kind of the, the, the reason I called the album complicated. No, yeah, do, 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 they'll make you the Agos album too, right? Yeah, he he played pretty much everything on it except for drums. Um, I, he brought in a very dear friend of his that he's known for many years, named Fabrizio Sc uh, Scatoni, and he's a gr ridiculously amazing guitar player in Italy. And I brought my drummer in, Edu Cominato from Soto, and he did all the drums. And it, basically, it was the four of us that that carved those two records out together. Right now, as as a solo artist, are you always like the the principal writer, or are you co-writing uh, with people like Alessandro Del Vecchio? I got to the point where I decided not to co-write on the music end of things because I'm not an accomplished pianist or guitarist. I I play well enough to kind of get the rudimentary stuff out, and you know, when I, if I can do an acoustic gig or whatever, I'm good enough to just kind of pull that kind of stuff off. But not being an accomplished musician, I think the riffs and the songs themselves are going to suffer. So I would rather have somebody who's very accomplished of what they do on their instruments and what they do as a writer come up with the music. And I'm more accomplished as a, as a, melod a melody guy or a lyricist. That's my forte. Let me complete the canvas, so to speak, after the music's already been kind of developed. Of course, I, I'll say, hey, I, I think we should 
shorten that, that section or maybe add another section here, but I don't mess with the flow of the song because somebody who's got great riffs and great ideas, I'm like, I could never come up with that. So why would I try to change uh-huh. it? That's good. Yeah. That's good. Uh, yeah. do, do, uh, do, do lyrics flow easily for you or is it Absolutely. something you have to, what oh, do they do? No. The lyrics are always, they, they, they literally come to me within minutes of me hearing any song for the first time. You give me a, an open canvas with no melodies and no lyrics. I hear the vibe of the song. I immediately know if it's going to be dark, if it's going to be heavy, it's going to be lighthearted. If it's going to be a love song, I know exactly how to treat it based on just hearing it back a couple of times. Well, that's great. Well, that's truly a gift then. Well, it's, I guess if you want to call it a gift, I mean, that's, that's my method. I mean, everybody's got their methods and how they create and how they carve out their, their different things, but that's something that just works for me. So if it works for me, I guess I'm not going to break it. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. Attention guitar players, join the Thimble Slide revolution and free your slide finger. The Thimble Slide is a mini guitar slide designed to be worn on the tip of your finger, about three quarters of the way down your fingernail. When worn there, you can still bend your finger, and most importantly, it's allowing enough of your fingertip through so you can press the guitar strings. The thimble slide is larger at the back and smaller at the front, so it follows the contour of your finger. So when you're wearing the slide, it's not loose or rattling around on your fingertip. This also allows your other fingertips in nice and close for playing. The sizing gap allows you to make the slide a little bit larger or a little bit smaller for a nice custom fit. So while you're wearing a thimble slide, you can, of course, use it as a slide. But more importantly, it allows you to still fret the strings so you can play the guitar. You can play chords. lines while wearing it. You can bend strings with your ring finger. You can drag your fingertip across the strings if you need to. You can do pull-offs, hammer-ons. So there you go. You can actually still really do all the things you need to do to keep playing guitars like that. With its patented shape, you can slide and fret while wearing the thimble slide. Visit thimbleslide.com. That's thimbleslide.com. These musicians on Complicated, they, it looks like pretty much the same team from Wide Awake in My Dreamland. Uh, how uh-huh. did how did you assemble this this team? Oh uh, well, on uh, on the music end, that was all Alessandro, and when he was sending me the songs, he he uses whatever uh, drum loop program. You know, they've got all these different things for for whatever if you're using Cubase or Pro Tools or whatever. And those were the general demos when he would send me those songs. And of course, we would use those as stepping stones for what the songs would eventually be like. And then I would just send that to my drummer, and he would basically just play along to the songs with. He, with a click track and no drums. So he was, he, he, with a click track, he'd be able to keep time and he knows exactly, kind of like the way I do with the lyrics and the themes, he knows exactly how to treat where they're supposed to be fills, we're supposed to be busy, we're supposed to be straight. And I, I, I trust him with every fiber of my being when it comes to uh, the drums and anything I do. Yeah, this, this team of musicians, I want to mention just quick as a RMA uh, representative, you know, um, it was Wide Wake in My Dreamland, you know, that uh, that that you won RMA awards for. And right, this, right. In, in this particular team of musicians. So I just want to read it down here. Uh, the okay. RMA award wins, you know, for Wide Awake in My Dreamland was its best musical performance, best nice. guitar performance. Tell, tell Fabrizio Uh-oh. did awesome. Yeah, best guitar yeah, performance. Yeah, awesome. And also the judges spotlight award for best male vocal, all for the uh, the song Love's Blind. Nice. You know? Yeah, it was a great one, you know. 
Nice, man. I, I, well, I appreciate the love and the attention I got on that. And uh, I, of course, I'm, I'm thankful to RMA for even recognizing it because it's, especially here in the U.S., it's very rare that uh, I get any attention on anything I'm doing unless it's something like a, a high profile thing like Sons of Apollo or Trans-Siberian Orchestra. My solo stuff just kind of falls to the wayside uh, and more known in South America and Europe and stuff like that. But uh, I, I appreciate the uh, the nod. Oh, I appreciate that too, man. It's like, uh, you know, we're, we're out here listening, you know, and hopefully as we nice. grow, we can do more and more for people too. Uh, right on. Yeah. Our, our, our mission. Based, our, our, based on talent too. The RMA are based on talent. No yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's it. That's important that that still exists as well, because most things are based on popularity and it's, it's yeah. good to know that, that there, there are people still looking out for and paying attention to talent. Yeah. Great, man. Hey, uh, with, uh, you know, the, uh, with the gear of today, you know, current, current, uh, uh, ability, uh, with such great home gear available, do you find yourself rec still recording in studios or are you recording mainly at home and maybe sending in tracks remotely? Right here, right there, mic. right there. Got my Amazing. Head. I'm doing a session before we started this. I've done everything pretty much in my home studio since, uh, blah, 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 blah. I want to go back to say 1996, maybe 94. It, when the technology was to the point where, I, I mean, the first jump for me that was affordable were when the they had those ADETs, you know, the the, uh, the oh, yeah. tapes and you link them together and you can have a 24 track studio in your house. But it wasn't as expensive as having a two inch tape and all that that you know, or going to a real studio. Then, of course, when the, the whole digital thing Pro Tools came along, I had to learn it because I knew that was the future that was going to give me the opportunity to do not only many sessions and, and do many creative outlets but it also gives me the chance to do things on my own without having to I, I i work better when there's nobody around you know behind my back or in my ear or hearing all the cricks and croaks and I'm, when i crack on something or i'm pitchy at something and you get the look from them it, it gets in your head if i'm by myself yeah. i'm the only one hearing that at the end they only hear what i want them to hear and that's that to me is where i get more um i, I get more results i get the results so not only did, that, not only yeah. that, you know, you do your best take ever, and they didn't record it. Yeah, yeah, oh, <laughs> or they punched over the wrong section. Yeah, it's, I've had too many nightmares. I, I honestly, I, I prefer doing it on my own. And of course, I, I'm always open to when I send it or listening back with somebody. I'm always open to ideas, but I need to get the initial idea done on my own, and Let's then. Then let me hear what you have to say about it after that, as opposed to stopping me midway or, oh, no, that lyric doesn't work. The way you sang that, try this. And that. No, I, I can't do all that. I, I do it on my own. And then then we deal with it after the fact. Also because of the feeling, too, you know. Yeah, of course. Sometimes yeah. you get the feeling and it's not perfectly in tune or it's not perfectly in time, but you get the right feeling for it. And then from that, you can you can pitch things or move yeah, them and yeah. manipulate them if you need to because you don't want to mess with the actual performance. I've done that before many times, but uh, for the most part, I, I can knock out a song within 20 minutes as opposed to being in a room with somebody else. There's a lot of distractions and banter yeah. and it takes two or three hours for one song. And I, I I just don't dig that. Yeah, that's that's terrific, man. Yeah, it's good to hear too. You know. uh, um, is there any plan at all to be touring with your own band? At the moment, uh, well, as I said, next year is my 40 year anniversary. I'm doing the Monsters Rock Cruise again, as I have for the past, uh, seven years i think it is and um i'm definitely planning a best of a kind of jss legacy set list i do that anyway when i go out on tour or I, when i do shows or appearances but for this one i'm really going to dig deep into making sure i cover as many tracks as i can within the confines of the short you know when you play festivals you may be given 60 minutes maximum um i want to make sure i cover all of that um I, I'm supposed to do some South America stuff where we're discussing those parameters right now. And of course I would love to do Europe as well, but I also have to, I have to commit myself to art of anarchy because we have an album to promote. We have, if, if things go according to as we want them to go, we're going to be putting this on the road. And I also have this uh, thing I do with Jason Beeler, the, uh, the guitar player and founder of Saigon kick for the past five years, we've been doing this little uh, dog and pony acoustic show. I, I, I I diminish it to that, but it's actually really cool. It's a kind of comedy cavalcade, flight of the Concord, tenacious D meets our own yeah. material. Thing. It's really fun. It's really funny. And we built it to the point where we could actually turn it into, I could leave everything behind and just do that for the rest of my life if I wanted to. But 
I want to do everything. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like it. Yeah. You know, before the year before complicated, I just want to touch on this one too. Year before complicated, you know, 2021, uh, I thought you had an interesting, an interesting release you know, called the duets collection volume one. And yeah. it's an album of duets with other great rock singers. And I, yeah. what inspired you to do that album? Well, during the lockdown, as we didn't know how long it was going to last, we didn't know how long we were going to be kind of sidelined and not be able to go out there and, and tour and even promote the records we were already doing. Uh, um, I had a meeting with the label of uh, what else can I do besides an actual new original album in between the albums, it's something a little more content, clearly not only for therapy reasons for me, just to be able to get through the fact that I, I can't go anywhere, I can't do anything. But obviously, you have to make a living as well. So we were trying to find something that made sense, not just to do a, at first they said, maybe do a covers album. I'm like, mm, I've already, I've done so many covers in my life. You can make five albums of all the things that I've done release wise. I really don't want to just sit here and try and come up with the right covers for it and then think people are going to like this. So I took it to the next step. I said, what about a, a JSS covers album? Because years ago, I did vocals for a Michael Schenker tribute album, but Michael Schenker played on the songs. He played on his own tribute album. So he did songs that everybody knows of, but he did all his guitars all over again and had different singers on it and different drummers and players. So I said, why don't we use that concept where I'll redo a lot of known songs throughout my career, but I'll do them as duets with other singers. And they said, that's a great idea. And I, as I was dropping the names of the certain people, like if you can get all these people in one go, let's do it. That's and really, man. The yeah, volume yeah. one, the volume one portion of the title was my idea because I kind of wanted to subliminally get it into people's heads that there there are going to be more. So go out and buy this one because the only way you're going to get a second one is, and a third one is if you buy this one. So unfortunately, I don't think there's going to be a volume two or three, but that was my idea to uh, to get people motivated to check it out. Well, you never know. I mean, you know, time. You know, there's there's you know, it could happen years down the line. It'll be just fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, did, did any one of those duets end up being your favorite? The one I did with Dino Jalusic absolutely is, is I mean, I, I love so many of the things I did on there with the other singers. They're all dear friends of mine. And I, I thank them profusely for, for doing this with me. But it truly, the, the, the first real item, my first real outlet was with Ingve Malmsteen as a professional singer, as my, my professional career started. So to take something that was from that old, from that era, and to redo it and to do it and to give it the respect and the tradition behind how that original version sounded all the way from the guitars to performances everything was almost identical to the the original rising force version but to then do it with somebody like dino who's the next up and coming uh it guy out there right now everybody wants dino jalusic and for me to be able to do that song with him it's kind of like father and son <laughs> situation it's like the old school and the new school combining mm -hmm. together he, he just knocked it out of the park and I, I just had a blast doing don't let it end with dino yeah, that, that 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 was my favorite one on, on there as well. Just uh, immediately, his voice just captured my my ears. You know, yeah, my my second, I think tied tied to first place, if not uh, in a really strong second, would be the one I did with Dean Castronovo because for everything had a reason or, or why I use particular singers for certain songs, and Dean Castronovo was the original drummer for Soul Circus, the band that did originally did that song. Neil and Neil Sean and I wrote that song together. And Dean was the first drummer on that version of uh, of that song. But most people learned later that Dean was a dead ringer for Steve Perry. And when Neil and I wrote that song, I went for full journey mode. I, I, I was even utilizing all my Perryisms, and and I really wanted that song to sound like it could have been a journey song. So I'm like, hmm, who else besides Steve Perry could I get to actually do this with that would actually give it that journey flow? And it was Dean Castronovo. It's great. Dean is a good job, uh, Steve Perry. I'll tell you something really funny, though. When I sent him the track, uh, he did his vocals. And then uh, he said, bro, man, I, I, don't, I don't remember playing so well on that, on that song. Or he said something to the effect of his performance drumming-wise on it. He goes, is that Virgil? I go, no, this is not even the original version of the song. He thought it was, we were just taking the original version and putting his voice on it. We uh -huh. re recorded that. So he's like, that has, that's a dude. That's my drummer from Soto. That's uh, my guitar player from Soto playing guitars. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That on that particular one is Howie Simon, my original guitar player from the JSS band. It, it's, it's totally, oh, wait, coming home. No, coming home was Jorge. And Jesus, no, coming home was Leo Mancini. I, I'm even confusing myself now. 
Leo Mancini, who's also somebody I use in South America, Brazilian, amazing Brazilian guitar player. He's the one on that track. And he really emulated Neil's vibe and the whole track. And Dean was like, dude, this sounds great. It sounds like us. <laughs> That's good. Hey, Jeff, um, thinking about your beginnings, um, how yeah. did you become a musician? You know, what inspired you to become a musician? Was was anybody in your family already a musician? We had, it was, I grew up in a very musical family on my mother's side because of, I didn't grow up with my father. Uh, he was, you know, I, they, they got, they got divorced and then we moved to California when I was about eight, but I was always surrounded by music, but nobody on my mom's side of the family pursued it. I just always had that bug. Me, my brother and I always wanted, we, we loved music so much that was, it really consumed our lives. And I knew I wanted to do this, you know, when, as, as young as say seven or eight years old, I remember watching even Michael Jackson, who was uh, about five years older than me or something like that, just going, well, he's a kid. And if he can do it, I'm a kid. I want to do it too. So I was kind of chasing it even as a kid, but I had nobody taking me to auditions or trying to get an agent or anything like that. It wasn't until I was in high school that I finally got into my first original band and started learning the craft of writing and creating your own stuff, as opposed to just singing other people's stuff. And it, honestly, it was uh, right out of a year out of high school is when I joined the Vay Malmsteen. So I got really lucky with all the timing, but it was my timing was right there. And then that I, I needed everything to start there. If, if everything dragged into my late 20s or early 30s and I started my career much later, I would have missed so many boats musically and everything just happened for the, the course that it happened. And Wait, when did you realize that you had a voice? As as long, as far back as I can remember speaking, to be honest with you. And, and I'm not patting myself in the back, but I've been singing since before I could literally talk, you know, make sentences. I've been singing since a, it's a wee boy. <laughs> that's great but I, knew, I knew as a kid you know when i would stand on a chair and emulate tom jones and michael jackson that that's what i wanted to do for a living <laughs> that's cool. um, i still stand on a chair and emulate tom jones but <laughs> <laughs> now your, your your folks um they, they've gotten to see a lot of your career right at what point did, did you feel like you had reached a successful point in your in your career with my dad, it was when, uh, in 1987, when Rising Force opened for Iron Maiden, and he knew I was doing music. He'd heard demos, he'd seen photos in different bands and everything. But the first time he ever saw me was us opening for Iron Maiden. So you imagine my father's coming to see his son, walks into this arena just packed with like 15,000 people, and I'm up there singing, and he's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> so that was, on my dad's side, that was that. My my mom seen every every facet of it from the small clubs to everything, but the the pinnacle for me was when Journey played at the Hollywood Bowl in two thousand six, and my mother was in the audience at the Hollywood Bowl watching her son performing with Journey. I mean that's that that was the end all be all as far as the family moment. That's that's an amazing moment. That's for sure. Absolutely, I I, I still get goosebumps based on because uh, that was always the dream, you know. You always have your, uh, in my old peachy folders, you know, growing up, we had those yellow folders with the sports and all these different figures on there. I would always draw uh, on the inside, the open area. I would say, I would write my goals. By the time I'm 18, I want to be in a signed band. By the time I'm 21, I want to have a gold album. I, I put my goals. And one of those goals was I need to play at the Hollywood Bowl. I need to play at the Forum. Never got to do the Forum, but I got to do the Hollywood Bowl. Wow, man. Wow. Well, there's, there's still time for the Forum. Oh, yeah. That was the time that I met you, I think. That's what, at Tom Dokken House. You oh, were, yeah, yeah, yeah. You were getting paid for, uh, it was for, for the greatest hits or from another album? I think it was a Lightning Strikes Again, Strikes Again album. I yeah. Think it, yeah. Yeah, and then we went, he drove me to the Steel Panther at the, at the Kick Club. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, guys, uh, we got just a few more minutes and we'll wrap it up. But I wanted to touch briefly on TSO, Trans-Siberian Orchestra. I got to touch on that, you know. Uh, where and how did you get the gig with Trans-Siberian Orchestra? I'll try to keep it brief. Uh, I've known the musical director from, and, and basically he's been there from the start, from the jump, Al Petrelli. Uh, I met Al when he was with Alice Cooper and I was doing the first Talisman tour. The last show on the Talisman tour was along with Alice Cooper at a festival in Sweden. And I'd already been in Sweden for a month. 
were just hearing Swedish, Swedish, Swedish. The only my only adversary at that point was Jason Beeler. But uh, we went back to the hotel and all I hear all these people speaking American, speaking in English. And one of the first ones I noticed was Al. And I've recognized that he'd just gotten off stage with uh, Cooper. We met, we bonded, and we've, we've been friends ever since. We fast forward to later when Al was, he did a stint with Sabotage and then the early stages of TSO. Uh, I remember seeing Al at a wedding and he said, yeah, I'm doing this trans Oh yeah, I've heard of that. And he explained what it was about. I'm like, mm, good luck with that. It, it sounded so far-fetched, it's not going to work. And then you watch what they became. And thank, thanks to Paul O'Neill, our, our, our invincible founder of TSO, he was working on an album called Night Castle. It was the one of the outside of the holiday seasonal things that they'd already been doing with TSO. And they tried every singer under the sun for a, a, a very key role for a double album that they featured five songs. Most of the singers do one or two songs in TSO, but this one was five songs. And it was literally days after Journey Let Me Go. I got a call from Al and said, hey, working on this album, my boss, Paul O'Neill, wants to meet you. Uh, would you be willing to come down to, to Tampa and meet him and, and see if you're good for this? And I, I, are you kidding me? I just got left go from journey. I, I'm wide open. Let, let's see what you got. I met Paul. We, we hit it off immediately. I got the gig and I've been part of the TSO family since. And I, I thank them and God bless them for being part of my life. It's, it's, it's amazing timing. That's for sure. And, and I got to, you know, for anybody who hasn't seen it, you know, this has got to be one of the greatest gigs on the earth it's one of the most spectacular shows that, that i've ever seen you know it's more spectacular than virtually most bands ever ever put on uh you know how do you guys rehearse a show for that you know, like that you know do, do you get a do you get a call do you get a call in september from from al you know all right guys yeah. time to time to dust off care of the bells you know <laughs> there are a lot of moving parts to tso al plays a very pivotal role on the music side of things we've got people that uh that deal with the the dancing with the singing uh management deal with all, all the moving parts of course but yeah we uh for years even since i started with them i think it was the first or second year that they were doing exactly what we've been doing ever since i started touring with them in 2008 and we all we all uh congregated in omaha nebraska there's a uh, an arena there that is not, they, they built a new one in Omaha and all the big shows and sporting events and all that happened there. And this one was kind of left for, well, we use it for flea markets and rodeos or whatever. So they were basically, we're wide open if you guys want to use our facility to rehearse. Because I think back in the day, they would rehearse it like SIR or one of the regular studios just to get the music side. And then they would have to go hire out a bigger production, post-production studio to, to do to do all the moves with the, the lasers and all that. It, it just became a nightmare housing everybody they, they decided let's take this arena and every year both bands all crew from both bands they basically built mirror images on both ends of the stages of, of, of the arena so we when we're rehearsing we can see the east coast stage when they're rehearsing they can see our stage wow and they have makeshift uh rehearsals backstage in the locker rooms so the west is rehearsing backstage the east can rehearse on their stage and then we swap out every other day and that's well, I mean, how we're it's and, amazing and, and it comes off i mean I, i've been there you know several times i got my tickets for this year and yeah. it is it comes off like clockwork it's, it comes off absolutely. perfect every year it's like you know how do you it's just a how, how do you this possibly why, reverse the staging it's amazing it's exactly why that we're able from the very first rehearsal to do it like that as opposed to doing it until we get the music right and then we have to now get used to all these you know moving parts and the best part is when you have a show like that, you never get to see yourself until you watch it on like YouTube or something. You never get to see what's actually going on behind you. When we're rehearsing, the East Coast production are doing all the moves and the fire and the lasers. So I'm on stage going, whoa, that's what it looks like. Even though our stage is just, you know, house lights, just so we can get our stuff done. We're watching the full production of the show happening as we're doing it, because that's where they rehearse their moves. And everybody just gets everything down to a science by the time opening night is as, is, is as exact and perfect as the final night. It's fantastic. I mean, you know, like I, I could be happy the rest of my life playing in that band. I, I think, you know, hey, Claudia, have you, have you seen, have you seen, seen the show? Yeah. Yes, yes, I did. And yeah. I saw, actually, but uh, my friend Kelly Keelan was in the band then. Right, right, right. So I yeah, came in at Kelly. Yeah. Yeah. And he, it's all basically it's all synchronized all the lights and all everything's, you know, but, with the click, I guess I don't know how they do it, but I think it. Well, some it. things are with Simpty, some things are with click, yeah. basically. And again, because uh, it, it's got to be perfect every time. 
on you. There's no room for error. And of course, there's going to be error. The, the, what's the old saying? The more the more shit you have, the more shit can go wrong. So yeah. clearly, that it re requires a lot of rehearsal. And even the rehearsals can be quite expensive because they have to fire off the cannons. They have to fire off a lot of the things that you normally would have to budget for the, the actual tour itself. So, but you got to get it right. If you if you want it to look right, you got to do it. You know, it, it's yeah. but it's everything about how we do it is the most effective way. And like I said, I've been doing this since 2008. Even during the pandemic, we did not go black. We or we didn't go dark. We we were able to present a live streaming show of that particular uh, of the one that we actually did a live streaming thing because we know we knew it was a TSO is responsible as it is responsibility every year to offer hope to offer um, the the storyline can be dismal it can be looking like oh no what's going to happen every life is hell and then at the end you have that Frank Capra esque ending of it's all going to work out everything's going to be cool and that's that's what TSO offers they offer hope they offer faith and and spirit you know that's again I I attest all of this to Paul O'Neill for the, he was part of every aspect from the music to the show when that cannon's going to fire off when this laser stops it he's part of he was part of every aspect of it and we lost him yeah. unfortunately in 2017 and uh his spirit's still with us and we're now just carrying on the show to make him proud it's great it's great show it is it's uh it really is like the greatest spectacle the greatest spectacular show that, that I've ever seen, you know, and, and you know, it's, it's a great right. way for any rock musician to usher in the new year or, or the, uh, the, the holiday season, you know, get out there and see TSO, man. It, we, we like to brand it. Well, Paul O'Neill branded it rock theater. It's basically like going to a Broadway show, but it's got the, all the rock elements, it's got a lot of hard rock and heavy metal elements, but it's also, it's all the bombast of kiss and, and the production of Pink Floyd. And, and basically you're, you're just going like, what did I just watch here? <laughs> exactly. How, how about a quick update on Sons of Apollo before we go? Uh, Sons of Apollo is pretty much dormant at this point. Everybody's pretty much uh, doing their own things. I don't think, I don't feel that there's uh, going to be anything happening with this band. I have to be honest with you. I don't, I'm not one of the ones to make that decision, but based on what I've seen and heard, I don't know that this band will continue as far as uh uh like like I just said based on what I've seen and and the fact that we're all busy and um I just don't know that there's going to be any interest from the the founding members to keep this thing going so this is why another reason I have to keep looking out for number 1 and my number 2 is working with uh with Ron I, I just call him number 2 that's not cool <laughs> uh, no but I I I want to work with Ron He's the, the one that's easier to work with in terms of accessibility. Mike's on so many different bands. Derek musically, he's doing a lot of his uh, his instrumental stuff, and 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 Billy as well. He's got, he's rounding off the Mister Big thing. He's got Winery Dogs. These guys, it's very difficult to even dream of starting something new with them. Ron and I would made the most sense, and that's why I I, I stepped into the whole Anar Art of Anarchy thing. Well, yeah, you've got, you know, you got Art of Anarchy going on. You got Trans Siberian Orchestra going on. You got your own solo career going on. You've got a full plate right there, my friend. Yeah. And and that's the thing, man. I, I'm, I'm not resting on my laurels. I'm not just uh, living on the past. I got to keep moving forward. And and I, I still have a lot more to say. I, I'm at the age where I'm not going to be a household name. I'm not going to be. There's no overnight sensation success for me. But I'm celebrating 40 years of doing what I've done. And I'm just going to keep doing that. Got you. Well, Jeff, that brings us to the end of our time today. Thanks so much for being a guest on our show and uh, staying a little bit longer than we had originally planned. Is but it's, it's great to, <laughs> great to get it all in, you know. So thanks for being uh, on. Uh, thanks for being I here with blab. us on interview sessions. Thank you, Cole. Thank you, Claudio. I'll see you guys you. You, Jeff. out there somewhere. We'll see you Absolutely, there. man. <laughs> and uh, for anybody you know, you want to keep in touch with Jeff, of course, JeffScottSoto.com, and of course, find him on social media. If it has a blue check, it's me. If it doesn't, it's not me. I'm Cole Coleman. And for Claudio Pesavento, the Rock Music Alliance, and the RMA Awards, thanks for watching and listening. Visit us at rockmusicalliance.com and check out this year's RMA Awards for rock, metal, and progressive rock music. Music.